You have been waiting five years for this moment. We are beginning a study of the book of Revelation. And while it is an incredibly daunting task, you should be encouraged to know that after studying through the Bible chronologically for the last five years, you are in an amazing position to understand the book of Revelation better than you ever have. Because there are over 400 allusions to the Old Testament in Revelation. Um, and if you think about it, one writer called it the capstone of the biblical canon. In other words, Revelation is the exclamation point to the entire Bible. And one of the reasons there's so many misunderstandings and abuses of Revelation is because people do not understand enough about the books that come before it. <laughs> but you all do now because of that five-year study that we've been through. And I think hopefully you'll, you'll be able to see things about Revelation that you may not have otherwise been able to see. But I think the, there, there is one other, I think it's the biggest reason why Revelation is so misunderstood, and I will share that with you after a prayer. <laughs> Father in heaven, we praise your name. We thank you so much for Jesus the Lamb, for showing us Lamb power, a, a power that is just so counterintuitive to this world, and yet is truly powerful, and that the world can do nothing to stop. We're so grateful for that. We pray for the discipline and the love and the, and the trust in you to live like Jesus the Lamb in our own lives as well, so that we can be victorious with you. Please be with our study um, of Revelation. Help us to not abuse it or twist it, but to use it in the manner that you intended. Help us to gain confidence and courage in the face of any persecution as a result of this study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I think the biggest reason Revelation is so misunderstood is because of a lack of understanding of how apocalyptic literature works. Now let me give you this illustration. Uh, let's say that you are in a book club and you're reading a fictional book and you read in this book, the city of Orlando was attacked by dragons and thousands were burned alive. Now you of course, would be a little disturbed by that. Like, okay, you know, that's a little rough, you know. But, but then there's a part of you that probably think it's kind of cool because you'd be like, whoa, this, this fictional book, like they use the city of Orlando in the, in the book. That, that's kind of neat. They, they used our city, you know, as an example. Now, now imagine, imagine if you, you read the same sentence, the city of Orlando was attacked by dragons and thousands were burned alive, but you read that in the Orlando Sentinel. Now what is your reaction? You're, you're spitting your coffee out, right? You're freaking out. You're trying, you know, calling your friends and your parents. What is going on? It's the same exact sentence, but why was our reaction so different? Why the difference in reaction, Will? The former was fictional. The latter was an example of nonfiction. All right, very good. Literary genre. Literary genre. A, a genre is a category or kind of literature characterized by similar form, style, or subject matter. For instance, poetry is a genre. Science fiction is a genre. Autobiography is a genre. Even junk mail is a genre, right? Got this, stole that from Mark Roberts. For example, it, um, if I were to, well, let me say it this way. Each genre has its own stereotypical format so that it really doesn't take long even just looking at a genre to tell what it is. For instance, if I were to ask you how books in the fairy tale genre typically start, what would you say? Look at what just happened. I mean, everybody in this room, right? You all knew because that's the fairy tale genre. That's how that genre works. There's a typical style and format that accompanies the genre. And the reason this is so important, as we saw in our newspaper example, is genre affects our interpretation, and even our methods of, of interpreting what we're reading, so that when we read a fairy, a fairy tale, we are reading that with a different interpretive mindset than we are when we read a newspaper. Look in Revelation 1 and verse 1. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John. The word revelation there is the word apocalypsis in Greek, which means an uncovering or a revealing. And this would immediately clue the audience into what kind of literature, what kind of genre revelation falls into. And it's the apocalyptic genre, 
which to us completely confuses us and causes our heads to explode. But for them, it was very common at that time to see works in this literary genre. In fact, not only do we find apocalyptic literature in the Old Testament, books like Daniel, especially the latter portion of Daniel, books like Ezekiel, Zechariah, but there were at least 14 other apocalyptic writings floating around even before the book of Revelation. Uh, many times uh, they were written by the Jews, uh, like the book of Enoch, the Apocalypse of Baruch, the Testament of Abraham, Second Esdras, the book of Jubilees. Right? You could just go on with the list. But as weird as this book seems to us, I just want to impress upon you, it was not weird to them at all. And if we can understand the apocalyptic genre, we will be in a much better and more responsible position to handle this book responsibly and read it properly. So when people hold the book of Revelation in one hand and the newspaper in the other, and they say, ah, see, you know, Joe Biden, you know, he's the beast and the, and the COVID vaccine, that's the mark of the beast, they're, they're misunderstanding Revelation. They are mishandling and, and not really understanding how apocalyptic literature works. So here's a definition for apocalyptic literature in, in, in a nutshell. There's a lot longer definition you could use here. But it's a vivid story written in a time of crisis and distress, given by otherworldly beings explaining how God will reverse everything so that the righteous will triumph. And what I want to do is just kind of walk us through and break this definition down as we go through um, the start of the class this morning. First of all, Apocalyptic literature is written in a time of crisis. Here's a question for you. Whenever God's people are suffering on the earth, especially, you know, from evil forces or whatever, what, what are some of the typical things that we are wondering? Why is God allowing this to happen? When's it going to end? Right? Does God care? About, does he even care? Does he even see, you know, what, what's happening to us? Is, is he still in control? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll explain more about the historical context of Revelation later, but just imagine that you are a Christian in the first century. You are a, a member of Christ's kingdom. Jesus has ascended to the throne of God. He's ruling. And yet it seems like the Roman kingdom is stronger than Jesus' kingdom. Because the Roman kingdom is killing Christians. And so you're wondering, hey, is Jesus king or what? You know, what, what, what have I done here? Well, how, how can Jesus let this happen? And, you know, as Matt said, when, when is this going to be over? So, for instance, look in Revelation 6, verses 9 and 10. These are Christians who have been slaughtered and martyred, and their souls are pictured as before the altar of God. And in verse 9 and 10, uh, it says, <clears throat> When the Lamb broke the fifth seal... I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So again, the, the Christian martyrs, they're wondering, when is God going to step in? When is he going to intervene and punish our, our enemies? And I just want you to see, this is super common in all of the apocalyptic literature. Daniel written during a time of crisis, Babylonian crisis. Okay? Um, same with Ezekiel. Zechariah, that was written in the crisis after the return from captivity when all the enemies were stopping them from, doing, from completing their work on the temple. Uh, other Jewish apocalyptic works, most of that was written during the intertestamental period, the 400 years of silence, when the Greeks were oppressing them and trying to force their culture and idolatry on them. So um, here's, here's an example. We just read Revelation 6. Here's an example from 2nd Esdras. This was written from, from Ezra's perspective, as if it were written by Ezra. How long and when will these things be? Why are our years few and evil? Did not the souls of the righteous in their chambers ask about these matters, saying, How long are we to remain here? And when will come the harvest of our reward? Sounds a lot like Revelation 6, right? Um, second Bar Baruch. Uh, Baruch was the scribe that worked alongside Jeremiah. This is written... Uh, as if it's from his perspective after the fall of Jerusalem, 2 Barak 3, 1 and 2. And I said, O Lord, my Lord, have I come into the world for no other purpose than to see the evils of my mother? But one thing I will ask of thee, O Lord, what is to happen to us? So you see that, that crisis mode. Now here's my question, and this is 
really more of a rhetorical question. If Revelation was filled with prophecy about our modern day, and all the symbols really are talking about Trump, and they're talking about Iran, and they're talking about COVID-19 and Apache helicopters, would that be of any help to the Christians undergoing crisis in the first century? No. And so here's really a, a first interpretive key, is that the classic mistake people make in every generation is to think that Revelation is a prophecy about their generation. <laughs> and that, that will, I, I imagine, sadly, that will only continue in the future. But it wasn't. It wasn't written uh, to address America 2,000 years later. It was written to address the first century crisis and to give those Christians comfort and, and hope. Secondly, and then I'll open it up for comments and questions after this point, it was written as a vivid story. Apocalyptic literature uses highly figurative language to paint pictures in our imagination. Since the audience, if you think about it, they're embroiled in an emotional, dramatic conflict. The writer uses emotion-evoking, dramatic imagery to capture the intensity of the drama that they're going through. So look in Revelation 13 now, in verse 1. Revelation 13, in verse 1. And, and before we read this, I just want you to imagine if John wrote in, you know, prose style, we would call it, Rome is really bad, and I just want you to understand, like, the reason it's bad is because, like, Satan's using it to do its bidding. Well, that would be a very true statement. But he doesn't say that. He says this, And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore, and then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems, and on his uh, heads were blasphemous names. So here's the thing. If, if you're a Christian and Rome is persecuting you and killing Christians, it's so much more relatable on an emotional level to picture this as this horrifying beast. It's a dramatic way to explain the utter wickedness of Rome and that God understands things are horribly wrong in the world and that he takes this threat seriously. Um, here's an example again from 2 Ezra's, and he, the writer uses symbolism Highly figurative language to describe Rome, but he uses the picture of an eagle in this section. <clears throat> he says, On the second night I had a dream, and I saw rising from the sea an eagle that had twelve feathered wings and three heads. I saw it spread its wings over the whole earth, and all the winds of heaven blew upon it, and the clouds were gathered around it. And, and what he'll do in this writing is just so fascinating. Uh, he'll go on to describe Rome as a beast also. And he'll talk about the Messiah coming as a lion to, to uh, really wage war against Rome. And the way he does that, though, is he, he speaks uh, words. And as he speaks, the, the whole body of the eagle is burned and its multiple heads begin to vanish. So here's a, a, a bit of that scene here in chapter 12, 1 and 2 of Second Ezra. While the lion was saying these words to the eagle, I looked and saw that the remaining head had disappeared. And when I looked again, they were already vanishing. The whole body of the eagle was burned, and the earth was exceedingly terrified. So again, we read in Revelation all this super highly symbolic language, and we're like, that's crazy. Like, what is he talking about? But for them, like, that wasn't crazy. They, they knew exactly what John was talking about. He was using these figures in language they, they all understood. Um, look back in Revelation 1, 1 again. <clears throat> and I just want you to notice that when, when Jesus, it, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants. Uh, and then later in the verse it says, he sent and communicated it. So Notice, when Jesus gives this revealing or this um, uncovering, he doesn't tell John, he shows John. It's visual language. In fact, the word communicated, you might have a, a, a footnote in your Bible for the word communicated, it means signified. Right? So he communicated it with signs, with, with symbols. And he, he then reports in, in verse 2 about all the things that he saw, right? So it's, it's, it's all very visual language characterized by signs and symbols and figures. Here's what to get from that. It's, it's really an interpretive key. And that is we need to focus on the big picture and ask what portrait is John painting for us 
with this language. You know, when, when we watch movies, that's, that's what we do, right? We, every scene in a movie is designed to portray a big picture. Okay, and so like, let's say it's a you know, romantic comedy or something, and you know, the couple, the, the, the uh, man and the woman, they, they meet in the grocery store, and they have this cute little interaction right, in the fruit section. When we watch that scene, we don't go, why are they meeting in the fruit section? That is, and why is that grocery basket colored green? And why is she wearing that bracelet? Like, we don't do that, right? Because those details are, that's not what the movie wants us to focus on, right? The whole point is, this is how Harry and Sally met, right? Or this is how, uh, what fill in the blank with all those other romantic comedies. This is how they met. So don't, don't get so bogged down in the details of Revelation that you miss the main point. So for instance, when Satan is described later as a great red dragon whose tail sweeps away a third of the stars of heaven, the point is not to get out a calculator and try to figure out how many stars there are and divide that by three, and then if the stars mean world leaders, then well, maybe he sweeps it. Stop it. It's just the dragon is powerful. If you have a tail and it's not even, it's like an auxiliary part of you. It's not even like the main feature of you. If, if this auxiliary part can just sweep away a third of the stars of heaven, that, that's pretty powerful. That's, that's an image that's meant to evoke our, our imaginations and to see the power of this beast. So again, don't, don't get so bogged down in studying the details of Revelation that, that what happens to so many people is they are, they are obsessed with all the trees. They're obsessed with all the individual trees and they miss the forest. I really want us to focus on the forest in this class. So what, my assignments for every class is whatever the reading is in the syllabus, you do that reading. And at the beginning of every class, my plan is to ask you, what is the forest? What is the big picture of those chapters? And, and we will make sure that we nail down the forest first before we worry about the tree. Because once you get the forest, the individual trees, even if you disagree with some of the details, it doesn't change the big picture. And the big picture is, is key. So comments or questions, there's still you know, much more about this, but um, comments or questions so far, anything we've said up to this point, Matt? Uh, the genre thing is there's something that, so that apocalypse, that word means revealing. Yeah. But us, apocalypse means the end of the world. Is that because people think the revelation is about the end of the world, so the apocalypse has become that? Yes. So it doesn't really mean the end of the world. Yeah, yeah. so uh, that's a good point. In our modern English, when we hear the word apocalypse, we think the end of the world. And, um, you know, I do think Revelation does address that later. Uh, and there is something I'm going to talk about in a second uh, about God reversing things in the world where he, he acts in judgment and all. So, uh, so there is some truth to that. But, yeah, we, we miss it. We've missed the main point of apocalypse. It, it's not the end of the world. It's an unveiling of God's future plans. And that will be culminated at the end of the world, God's future plans, but there's a lot of other plans, you're right, that are going to take place be, before that happens. So, yeah, good, good thought there. Tom? I did mention the, the vivid nature of the story and its design and the emotional impact, among other things. Um, just thinking about the descriptions of, of the dragon and the beast and probably no way of knowing this, would, it, would there have been any uh, idea of presenting it in this way so that I'm just coming forward to America a few thousand years later, but um, sometimes we get used to our environment, we get used to things that are happening to us. I wonder if in that day, look, as you said, Satan's really bad. Um, just in two years, don't forget that he's really bad. Don't get used to him being. Yeah. Okay. Around you, you know. <coughs> yeah. I do believe. I'm going to talk in more detail about this later in the class, but I do believe Revelation, even though it's not prophecy about our modern day, it gives us a lens through which to interpret the world and to see the world as Satan pulling the strings behind political powers to try to accomplish his will on the earth and persecute Christians. Like, that's something that actually repeats itself throughout history right? and is not unique just to the first century. So this opens our eyes and keeps us... No, no. Back then, would there have been a sense where I had gotten used to, um, I was boiling slowly in the environment instead of recognizing. Okay, okay, I see your point. Sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, yeah. So, so some of the imagery is so emotional because it's designed to wake the Christians up. 
because they, and we'll see that in the, in the letters to the seven churches of Asia, uh, a lot of them are complacent and they're compromising with the culture. And Jesus says, look, you know, you better straighten up or I'll remove your lampstand from, from the church and, you know, you'll be in trouble. So, yeah, we'll definitely talk more about that. And I, I think that's a really good point. Um, Jason and then Phil and then we'll move on. Your, uh, your point about focusing on the big picture of John, I, I think is, is we can take that one step back further and understand where Revelation fits into the big picture of, of Scripture. You know what I mean? God was not setting up the Bible to prophesy the existence of America. I know we place a lot of importance on America as a Christian country, but there are Christians worshiping all over the world today. They're not just in America. And, I mean, you're talking about, oh, people say troubles in prophecy. In fact, I remember growing up when they said Ronald Reagan was 666 because his name was Ronald Wilson Reagan. Six letters, six letters, six letters. I mean... That totally defies what you're talking about. The, the, the big picture of Scripture is the reuniting of God with man. Absolutely. And and yeah. What does that have to do with that? Yeah. And, and, and then, like you say, you're trying to take Revelation and, and twist it. You're taking it out of the context of the uniting of God with man. Sorry. Phil. Absolutely. Yeah. Really good. Really good thoughts. So. You mentioned in Revelation six about the ones who were slain and the question that they asked. Mm -hmm. My question is, if they've already been slain, why would they be asking the question? Wouldn't they already have that answer? And if so, then is he writing this in such a way to speak about those who are still alive that are going to be slain to prepare them? Because he understands that that's the question they have before they die. How long are you going to let this happen? Are you going to let me die too? Yeah. Or am I going to be you know, exempt from that? Yeah. And I have to deal with that. So I think he's dealing with two audiences there. He's showing... We understand the dilemma as Christians, God doesn't give us all the answers. And when temptation comes and trial comes, we, you know, we have these same reservations, these same issues that pop up in our own mind. Because we don't really want to have to suffer in that we don't That's for sure. And luckily, I, I don't think we're going to have to suffer as bad now like they did back then. Yeah, That's for now, we, yeah, then spared so, that. But, but it is the deepest question to the believer's heart. God, if you really love me, you're going to save me, you're going to forgive me. Why would you let me go through this type of suffering? And if so, how long is it going to be? Yeah, no, that's really good. Yeah, that, those, those are really good thoughts. Um, uh, and, and really, this third point gets to what you're saying, Phil, because it, it, it reveals behind the scenes in heaven. So if you're on earth and you have fellow Christians who have died, you might be thinking like, well, you know, what? Well, what, what's with them? Like, did, did Rome defeat them? But really, they're, they're with God. And so it shows that they're victorious. And, and actually, they, they care that justice is being carried out. And we see that in these scenes of heaven. If you think about it, when, when we're going through any crisis on the earth, we're wondering, what in the world is going on in heaven? <laughs> right? what, is God, does God see it? Does he care? Uh, how can he let this happen? And apocalypse is about uncovering or revealing what's going on in heaven. That's why apocalyptic literature typically involves visions of heaven by the author, or the author is taken on a heavenly tour by an angelic being. Um, so, uh, for instance, we, we just saw chapter 1, verse 1 of Revelation, uh, with John there being shown this revelation by an angel. Look in chapter 4, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. He says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. So, so he, he kind of has this like uh, spiritual, out-of-body uh, transportation to heaven. And, and again, it, this, this kind of heavenly journey by the author is so common. It's just a common pattern. That's how apocalyptic literature works, just like once upon a time for fairy tales and just like in a galaxy far, far away, right? For Star Wars, right? It's just a motif. So for instance, um, First Enoch was written from the perspective of Enoch before the flood, when remember the earth was so just horribly corrupt. That was the crisis going on then. Uh, from Enoch's perspective. And so it says this, the words of the blessing of Enoch, who will be living in the day of tribulation. Enoch, a righteous man whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in, he in the heavens, which the angels showed me. And from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw, but not for this generation, but for, rem for a remote one uh, to come. So it, it was a time of crisis where the entire earth was corrupted and God you know, shows Enoch you know, this, this vision, at least in, the, in this book. Uh, of heaven pulls the curtain back. And you know, the awesome thing about this is that when the curtain of heaven is drawn back, 
you see that all of the earthly events that we're suffering from are a result of spiritual warfare in heaven, right? You're, you're not just suffering because Rome is evil, but because Satan is behind the scenes. And he's using Rome and Rome supporters as his puppets to do his will. And when that curtain is pulled back, it shows us God sees everything. He, he knows exactly what's going on. He's in control. And like uh, C.S. Lewis said in the about Aslan in his, in his Chronicles and Arnest series, God is on the move. Uh, this is a powerful thought. Aslan's on the move. You know, the, the lion is on the move. He's, he's getting ready to do something. It's not just that he sees it. He's going to do something about it. And that leads to this fourth por- part about apocalyptic literature. God's going to reverse everything. God, you know, he's, when you see God in heaven, like especially chapter 4 and 5 sitting on the throne, he's not panicking at all. He, he's totally under control. And all of this in Revelation is exactly what God promised would happen back in Daniel's day. We're going to look at this in more detail in a few minutes. But Daniel 7 foretold that the Roman Empire would persecute Christians and that Christians would dominate them and would win. Revelation is about the fulfillment of Daniel 7's prophecy. And that means God is in control and he's going to keep his word to his people. And it may seem like the world is just completely upside down right now for these Christians, but God is going to reverse everything and make things right again so evil will no longer triumph and the righteous will win. In fact, this theme is so common in apocalyptic literature, it has been dubbed the apocalyptic cure. When God reverses the situation by judging the enemies and bringing peace to his people. There's an entire field of study, by the way, devoted to apocalyptic literature. So all the stuff that I'm, I'm saying, it's very common. You just go look on Amazon. I can recommend a, a couple of books uh, to you on, on the subject if you wanted to look deeper into it. But this is just so common. So, for instance, Second Ezra's, again, um, chapter 11, says this, Therefore you, eagle, remember this is talking about Rome, Therefore you, eagle, will surely disappear, you and your terrifying wings, your most evil little wings, your malicious heads, and your most evil talons, and your whole worthless body, so that the whole earth, freed from your violence, may be refreshed and relieved, and may hope for the judgment and mercy of him who made it. First Enoch, well, what was the apocalyptic cure in Enoch's day? The flood. That's what reversed everything, created a new heavens and new earth, a totally different environment when they came out. The earth shall be wholly rent asunder, and all that is upon the earth shall perish, and there shall be a judgment upon all, but with the righteous he will make peace, and will protect the elect, and mercy shall be upon them, and they shall all belong to God, and they shall be prospered, and they shall all be blessed, and he will help them all, and light shall appear unto them. And this is exactly what Revelation does. It it repeats the apocalyptic cure over and over again in the book. God intervening, judging his enemies, and bringing peace and relief and blessings for his people. So here's just an example. Look in Revelation 19. Revelation 19. After these things, 1 and 2, uh, Revelation 19, verses 1 and 2. After these things, I, I heard something like a voice. Well, let me just say this. The, uh, Rome is you know, defeated in chapter 18, uh, totally brought down. So now, chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, because his judgments are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. So again, you know, God, he brings judgment on the wicked city of Rome, and he brings blessings for his people. And in fact, the way that Revelation ends is chapter 20, He's bringing judgment down on Satan, the dragon, and and the two beasts that we're going to talk about in a second. And then Revelation 21 and 22, it's about a new heavens and new earth. It's about a totally new situation where there's no evil anywhere, and only righteousness dwells, and God's people can just live in peace in His presence forever. This is why the main message, really, of all apocalyptic literature is that God and His people win. That's the message of all apocalyptic literature. Um, but the book of Revelation is unique in that it makes one all-important clarification, and that's in the theme verse that we read for the Lord's Supper in Revelation 17, 14, that it's the Lamb that gives us the victory. 
that the Lamb is the one who overcomes the enemies and gives peace to his people. This, th this verse shows us the way that God and his people win is through the Lamb. And the Jews, you know, when they wrote that other apocalyptic literature, like, they understood God and his people were going to win. They didn't think it was going to be through a lamb. <laughs> they thought it was going to be through a lion, through a military leader and just conquering and smashing. And it's through a lamb. That's the power of Revelation that gives it that unique flair and, and sets it apart from all the other apocalyptic literature. Um, there are some other characteristics that do as well. But this is just the main, the main point that victory comes through the blood of the lamb that was, that was shed on our behalf. So that's, um, that's the apocalyptic genre. Any comments or questions, Ramona and I saw him. <clears throat> we know Christians do suffer, and they, they suffer in every generation. And yeah. this is why we're warned over and over not to give in, that we always stay true to God, and yeah. we never deny Him. Mm -hmm. So that's the most important thing, is yeah. no matter what happens, we, we cannot deny God. Definitely. And, and really, this, I meant to put this up, sorry. Jesus and his people win, right? That's the message of Revelation. So God and his people win, Jesus and his people win. Um, and what you're saying is so true, Ramona. And the, the way Revelation helps us stay faithful is by reminding us of this fact, that if you stay faithful, you'll be victorious, just like Jesus, who died and was faithful, and he's victorious. And so we follow the Lamb into the new creation, essentially. Um, let's, let's keep going here. Let's talk about the enemies. Uh, one writer calls this the unholy trinity. I really like that. Uh, we often talk about the holy trinity, even the God, the Father, the God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. Uh, well, in Revelation, the enemies of God form a trio as well, but it's, a, it's an unholy trio. First, you have the dragon in Revelation 12 and verse 9. And the good news, gratefully, is that it just says it, who the dragon is. Like, verse 9, it just says that Satan, he's the serpent of old. Like We, we know exactly who that is. That, that's just fantastic. No guesswork involved. But now notice in Revelation that Satan, the dragon, he's going to give some of his authority to the second figure, the beast from the sea, in Revelation uh, 13. So um, if you look back in Revelation 13, we read verse 1. Look in verse 2, the description of this beast. It says, The beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. So, so this beast is, he's just really vicious looking. And he, he's kind of a composite beast, right? He looks like a lion and a, and a leopard and a bear. And, and I think the point is he, he shares all of the, the characteristics of those beasts uh, that went before it. He has Satan's authority to tempt and to accuse and to bring death to the world. And gratefully, we know from Daniel 7 who this beast is. Because Daniel has a vision of four beasts. You remember in Daniel chapter 2, he also has a vision of four parts of a statue. And those four parts of a statue in Daniel 2 represented four kingdoms. Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Well, in Daniel 7, when he has a vision of four beasts, it's the same thing. It's the same four kingdoms. Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome as that fourth beast. And in Daniel 7, the first uh, the first beast that he sees, this is just so fascinating, uh, the first beast that he sees uh, was the Babylonian kingdom, and that beast looked like a lion. The second beast was the Persians, who looked like a bear, and the third one was Greece, and they looked like a leopard. And this is what he says about the, uh, about the fourth kingdom. He says, or the fourth beast. After this, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and exceedingly strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So the Roman beast, we would say, was a whole nother beast, right? It was a beast on a whole nother level of ferocity. And notice when John describes this beast in Revelation 13, 2, as having the power, he, he, what he's doing, he's describing this beast as having the power of all three kingdoms that came before it. That it has the power of the, the Babylonian lion and the power of the, the, the Persian bear and the power of the Grecian leopard, all combined as part of itself. <laughs> and it's stronger than all of them combined. Super, super terrifying. And Daniel later says this, that there's one of the horns of that fourth beast will come up, and it says this in Daniel 7, 21, I kept looking, that horn was waging war with the saints 
and overpowering them. So he's, he's waging war against God's people. And look at the result in the next verse. Until the Ancient of Days came, and his judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. This is a theme all throughout Daniel 7, that Rome is going to cause serious problems for God's people, but God is going to step in, intervene, and God's people are going to win and have the, the kingdom that's everlasting. Here's how this, uh, this chapter ends. Chapter 7, 26 and 27, the court, this is really the heavenly court, will sit for judgment and his dominion, the dominion of the beast, will be taken away, annihilated, destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. Just want you to see, Revelation is the fulfillment of Daniel 7 and God's victory over the beast of Rome and the establishment of, of God's eternal kingdom, which can never be destroyed. Essentially, uh, Daniel is saying... Jesus and his people win. That's what Daniel 7 is saying. And Revelation is coming along and saying, yep, remember Daniel 7? Jesus and his people win. Really, really cool. Really, that's why, that's why they, uh, that one writer called it the capstone of the biblical canon, right? It, it just brings all prophecy to its, to its ultimate uh, fulfillment. Now, if we go a little bit further, there's another beast, not from the sea, but from the earth. In verses 11 and 12 in Revelation 13, it says, And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. We'll talk about that fatal wound healing stuff later. But this, this beast is interesting because he looks innocent like a lamb, like Jesus but he speaks like the dragon. Sounds like false religion? Yeah, it's because it is. In the first century, there was a major influence in Asia Minor known as the emperor cult. And notice that verse says, they, they forced people to worship the first beast. They forced people to worship Rome. They believed by worshiping the Roman emperor as one of the gods, they could curry favor from the Romans, like military protection and uh, political power and financial benefits. In Asia Minor, uh, where these seven churches are that Revelation is addressed to, people erected statues of emperors all over the place where they were honored as gods. They built temples. They had their own priesthood to offer sacrifices to the emperor as God. And you know, this wasn't necessarily like one specific group that, that called themselves the emperor cult as much as a mindset and a philosophy that spread throughout all the citizens. Now, that, that philosophy kind of came from the wealthy and the elite in society, but it, it really permeated all of society to the point where it was basically believed emperor worship was part of your basic civil responsibility. If you want to be a citizen in our town, you have to worship the emperor. And if you're a Christian and you don't do that, what that means is you're a threat to our city because if you don't worship the emperor as God or any of the other false gods that we worship, you're going to bring curses down on our city. You're going to bring the wrath of the Roman emperor down on our city. And so you're a threat to us. And this is what really spawned the, the persecution. Uh, and so this, this beast from the earth is forcing people to worship the, the beast. And if they don't, they're persecuting Christians by putting them to death. They're slapping economic sanctions on them so they can't buy and sell stuff in, in the market. Uh, a lot of the um, people, citizens in the emperor cult or had that mindset were in trade guilds. So it was groups of artisans and craftsmen that um, had like a union-like arrangement with each other that said only those who are members of this trade guild can buy and sell in our city. So if you're a Christian, you might be an artisan and a craftsman yourself, but if you don't worship the emperor as God, you're not in the trade guild. You can't buy and sell here. You're going to have economic problems. And so look in chapter 13. Let's just continue verse 15. It was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all the small and the great and the rich and the poor and the freemen and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. And again, we're going we're to get into all that stuff, mark the beast. We'll get into that later. I just want you to see what these Christians are, are up against here. And um, let me give you this historical context now, that the evidence we have, especially from the writings of the early church fathers, is that Revelation was written by John the Apostle, same, same one who wrote 
the Gospel of John and the letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He writes Revelation during the reign of the Emperor Domitian in the 90s AD. And it was written to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And at this time in the 90s AD, the emperor cult was particularly strong. And, and Domitian, the emperor, he was one of the very few emperors who actually at that time accepted worship as a god. Um, only a couple others, Caligula and Nero, accepted those titles of, of deity. But he actually demanded people address him as Lord God Domitian. So you can see how that you know, presents a problem for you as a Christian who your only Lord and God is Jesus and, and, and the Father, right? Uh, so... The other thing from history that we know is that Domitian, he had a habit of exiling people and sending them off to islands as like penal colonies, like Alcatraz, right? It's just like a prison island. And so that's where John is actually. Look in, look in chapter 1 of Revelation, verse 9. <clears throat> oh, that's Jude. I was like, that's different. Okay, <laughs> Revelation 1, 9. Um, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and, and kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So, so John, you know, because of his testimony of Jesus, because of his refusal to worship the emperor, like he's on this, this island, this prison, and he's really the, just the first fruits of many other Christians who will be persecuted for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And Revelation is written to remind them that God is in control. And that Jesus and his people uh, will win. Now, let me answer this, uh, go through this last section here, and then I think there'll be one or two minutes uh, for you guys to comment. How is all this relevant to us today? Someone might wonder if Revelation was written to address God intervening in the Roman crisis, well, how in the world is this, does this help us today then? Well, it's because as human beings, we tend to do the same things over and over again. And so history is very cyclical, right? What's that saying? If you don't know history, you're doomed to repeat it. Why? Because we just, we just don't learn. We just keep making the same mistakes over and over again. So it's always just a matter of time before some wicked world power exalts themselves against God and his people. And they become like a new beast being used by Satan you know, to do his will in a, in a different generation. Uh, it's just a matter of time before people make new false idols, and they want Christians to fall down and worship at that altar. I mean, this idea of the emperor cult, you know, the, the, the wealthy elite controlling the narrative in society and getting all the people in society to kind of go along with the narrative and worship the emperor, like, that's very reminiscent of what's happening right now in our culture with the rich and wealthy elite and the media narratives basically trying to pressure Christians to bow at the altar of the LGBTQ plus altar. And if you don't bow at that altar, then, you know, you, you should be hated and exiled and, and killed because you're worthless. That's where it's headed. And to be honest, Rome in Revelation 17 is also described as a harlot. And the harlot that he describes sounds a lot like America in many ways, who seduces the world through its love of materialism and luxury and extravagance. So we're going to have a lot of soul searching to do too for ourselves in America when we read Revelation. Um, so what Revelation shows us is a pattern of history that will continue to be repeated until the final day of judgment when God finally deals with Satan and restores all things. Uh, I love this quote by David uh, Aoun, if I'm pronouncing that right, I have no idea. Anyway, he says, the special genius of apocalyptic literature is its ability to universalize the harsh realities of particular historical situations by transposing them into a new key using archaic symbols of conflict and victory, suffering and vindication. Thus, the beast from the sea represents Rome, yet more than Rome. Revelation becomes a linguistic key uh, or, or lens uh, by which to describe any period of history. So while Revelation is not a prophecy about later generations like America, it presents a pattern that every generation, past, present, and future, follows. And so we should absolutely see parallels in our, in our modern day today. And in every age that we suffer evil in this world, we're going to be wondering, where is God does he care? What's going on in heaven? What, what is happening? Is he going to do anything? And Revelation will be right there for us to answer confidently. God does see. He does care. And he is on the move to bring judgment upon our enemies and to bring victory for Jesus and his people. Um, I didn't leave much time for comments. We are going to have a second part of uh, 
introduction on Wednesday night. Part of me wishes we could just stop here right now and say, all right, everybody, let, we're done with Revelation. Uh, because A, it's just going to be hard. Uh, but B, I, I don't want to miss the forest. You know the forest now, right? And man, that, just the forest is so enriching. Uh, but as we continue to go along, we are going to get into the individual trees. But hopefully we can keep the forest in the forefront of our mind as we study those individual trees moving forward. So thanks so much. If you have any comments or questions left over, you can ask them on Wednesday night where we'll continue our introductory studies. Re-Revelation 1.